Call to order, we're not, we have no need for a roll call, and then we will mark everybody's attendance. Good afternoon, I'm Wisconsin State Senator Mary Felskowski, and I will be chairing this meeting today. I'm going to ask for a motion to waive the quorum requirement. A second. All those in favor? Aye. And then I would also ask for a motion to approve the April 13th, 2024 and May 31st, 2024 meeting minutes. A second, please. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Well, thank you, everyone. And we're going to start today with a continued discussion on the NCOIL Transparency and Third Party Litigation Financing Model Act. You can view the latest version of the model in your binders on page 122 and on the website and app. Before we go any further, I'll turn things over to the sponsor of the model, Indiana Representative Matt Lehman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. I know we got a lot to talk about. We have quite the, uh, quite the attendance here to speak, and so I look forward to that. Um, I want to make sure I, I, I'm clear on one thing. I want to stay focused on what I have said for years has been my fundamental philosophy at NGOIL is we are not creating model language that goes back and gets stamped in your states for approval. This is where you, this is where we build the foundational structure of a bill. You take it back to your state. So I know we've had some discussions around rate and other things that in my opinion really belong more in the states. <clears throat> so I do appreciate all the input people have given. Um, I think we've made good progress. Uh, we had a meeting, interim meeting in May. Since that time, we've made a couple changes to the model. Some are just technical, some are from clarity. And then there's two, I think, what I call substantive changes, which I'll discuss here. <clears throat> First substantive change is around um, making sure that individuals are added to the definition of a foreign country of concern. We talked about adding that, that we want to keep the entities that are foreign governments that are bad players out. We also want to keep individuals who are on the list for the federal government that are bad players out as well. So they have been added. <clears throat> That's in section three of the model on page 124. The other substantive change uh, is to section seven and 16 of the model, which are on pages 128 and 133. These expand the scope of disclosure. They take that to a disclosure of litigation financing uh, now required versus awaiting for discovery. Um, the model now requires that agreement of a disclosure uh, without awaiting all the parties of litigation are, are, and are responsible to get that, including those who have a duty to defend the party in the litigation. I want to be clear that I think there are four, <clears throat> four very core parts of this bill that I think we need to stay focused on. Um, one of those is who can do this? We talked about adding the individual. We want to be clear that we do not want to make our judicial system a trading floor. Uh, we don't want people to look at it and say, is this a good investment or a bad investment? So we've got to make sure we know who is, who is behind these uh, investments. Uh, second is, is to make sure they do not have access to data. Uh, there's no, there should be, never be a process where I can file a suit only so I get a seat at the table so that I can take proprietary information. That's in this bill. I think we need to make sure that their role is very clear. Uh, you do not dictate the direction of the suit. Uh, as the funder, you are providing the money and you step aside. The legal profession will determine the direction that should go. So you have no say in that direction of the suit. And then the fourth, which is the new one, which is the disclosure versus the uh, discovery. <clears throat> I know there are some folks that are opposed to that, and we're going to hear about that today, but I made those changes because I want to hear. I want to hear why that disclosure is bad public policy. Um, I think as lawmakers, we're required to pass legislation that's good public policy and transparency, in my opinion, is always good public policy. Um, I know this language, the reason I took this language too was, and he's not here, but uh, uh, Assemblyman, um, uh, Assemblyman um, uh, Westfall, Steve Westfall, just slip me for a second, uh, had this language in West Virginia, um, and I felt like it was relevant, uh, that if it's relevant in West Virginia, it's relevant here, and so I think it's key that this be put into, into that. And my understanding was there was not a lot of opposition to this in West Virginia. So I, again, I want to have that discussion. Um, so we hear those comments. I'd also like to stress that the version before you is not going to be the final version. Uh, we're really trying to get this in a good place, like I said, that it's foundationally, structurally sound. 
Uh, we'll probably have an interim call yet between now and November, and then hopefully can uh, convene in San Antonio and pass this out in November. Um, so for now, I'll stop there um, and just make a note that I want to, uh, I know there's a lot of people who want to talk about this, and I again want to go back to just make sure as we talk today that we are respectful of positions and again around the area of good public policy uh, on that. So with that, Madam Chair, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Representative Lehman. Um, we have several speakers here today and we need to remain on schedule. So we are going to put some time limits on. Professor Klein, if you can please keep your remarks to 10 minutes at most. For everyone else, if you haven't spoken on this model before, and that will include Brad, Mahima, and Will, you'll be capped at five minutes. And for everyone else, since you have spoken on this model before, your remarks will be capped at three minutes and limited to only the changes that have been made to the model since our last discussion. With that, Professor Klein, please go ahead. Thank you. And, um uh, I, I will keep it to 10 minutes. I realize I have the biggest bucket. I will say that uh, Representative Lehman just changed what I'm going to say. So my slides are public facing and uh, you can read them. Next slide, please. Um, my, okay. Um, doing better? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, as I say, I have, uh, next slide, please. So I'm Ken Klein. I'm a law professor. Before that, I was a business defense attorney. My entire professional life has been defined, among other things, by defending cases and uh, by insurance. And so I'm happy to talk about this stuff. It intersects them. Next slide, please. Um, so I just want to tell you an opening thought. And Representative Lehman, I have to tell you with all candor, in many ways, from a defense attorney's perspective, all that litigation is, is setting price. It is setting price on a dispute. That's what it is. And it was never lost on me as a defense attorney that I had a built-in advantage because time and resources were on my side. And if I found out that a plaintiff had resources as well, such as a TPLF, that was bad news because it meant I couldn't squeeze them, that I was going to have to win this one on the merits. Next slide, please. Um, so I, I had intended to talk about these four vectors that I read in the, in the, um, in the Model Act, but, but we'll see where it intersects. Next slide, please. So first, let's just talk about protecting consumers, the consumer side of this. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, intuitively, TPLFs feel wrong, right? They feel like payday lenders or credit card companies that are being overaggressive. They feel predatory, and so we want to we want to cap rates or amounts of return, but they are not the same as these other entities because the plaintiff has an attorney, right? The plaintiff has an attorney who tells them, this is what they're being willing, offering to lend you, these are the terms of the loan, this is what you can expect out of the litigation. So they don't need the protection, the consumer protection of caps on rate of return or, uh, or the equivalent of usury laws. Rather, what you're going to do with these things is you're going to not help any consumer, but you are going to hurt some who need the money, and for them it's a fair deal informed by their attorney. Next slide, please. I will note as a technical matter that the Model Act has some strangeness in its, in its definition of a consumer in two ways. A consumer is basically defined as a flesh and blood individual who is in your forum state as a resident. That means that you provide no protection to a plaintiff who is from the next state over. And you provide no protection to an individual who has organized their business as a small company or a partnership because they are no longer a flesh and blood human. Next slide, please. Deterring foreign bad actors. Now, I will just tell you, for me, it is a mystery why this is a state level issue as opposed to a federal issue. But I will tell you that the notion of foreign-owned entities being across from me or people whose motives were other than the merits of litigation is nothing new. For example, many reinsurers are owned by foreign entities. Many insurers have some foreign ownership interests. And many litigants are have bad motives. They're actually seeking to acquire information from their opponent. That's why they're in the process. These are not new problems for the litigation system. We have existing architecture to deal with it. That architecture works. There is nothing special about TPLFs in this regard. 
And so if you add a layer of regulation for TPLFs, all you're doing is burdening the system, making it more expensive to get to a result without gaining any extra benefit. Next slide, please. The I in NCOIL is insurance, right? So we're talking about insurance and the pressure on insurance premiums, except the industry's own data, and in particular, I'm linking about an Insurance Research Council study that was released over the turn of the year, shows that, in fact, litigation costs do not correlate to rising premiums. That's not the driver. Now, the second point here is important. On the commercial side of TPLF, and I believe other panelists work in that space, insurance companies are usually not involved. And so it's not an insurance issue in commercial TPLF for the most part. Next slide, please. Recalibrating the system. Next slide, please. The litigation system already has cradle-to-grave architecture to weed out frivolous lawsuits. And there is a lot of study on that in my space, which is legal scholarship. And what it concludes is that is working. Fundamentally, frivolous lawsuits do not, on the main, proceed through the system. So the end of the day is anything you do, including this act, that makes litigation harder to win, harder to file, makes all litigation harder to win and harder to file, but most litigation is not, in fact, frivolous. So primarily, you are hurting meritorious cases without weeding out very much frivolous cases. Next slide, please. Now, this issue has actually been studied, and this references that study. And all I'll say is, these economists, and there has not been any contradicting paper that has followed on, actually looked at, does TPLF involvement increase frivolous litigation? No evidence of that. Does it, in fact, deter wasteful bullying tactics? Lots of evidence for that. Next slide, please. By the way, I don't think I have a slide on control, but I will say this. Insurance companies do control litigation when they're insured is the defendant. So if control's an issue, you better look at both sides. Now, the last thing on this slide is disclosure. Here's the thing. I have, as a defense attorney, an inherent advantage. I know that I am likely over-resourced as opposed to my opponent. If I'm a TPLF funding the plaintiff, it doesn't matter to me whether you know about me or not. It doesn't harm me if you do know about me. But you know who it does harm? It harms the plaintiff who doesn't have a TPLF because they have now been isolated as the plaintiff the defendant can squeeze where it doesn't slow anything down on the other side. Next slide, please. Okay, so I just have basically three closing thoughts. The first is, it's not really clear to me why TPLFs are an insurance issue, okay? They aren't driving premium. The second is, this is an unbalanced system. Right? It's a system that favors defendants. I love that as a defendant. But what I'm telling you here is you want to know what was the monetization of my advantage? There's a pretty good measure of it. The net profits a TPLF makes are a pretty good measure of what was my advantage as a defendant. Or put another way, a TPLF is simply a fund that is looking at the landscape of commercial real estate, the stock market, a variety of other investments, and saying, where can I make the most return on my money? If you as a defendant, an insurance company, for example, are finding that TPLFs look at the landscape and say, you know the place where I can make the most money? Investing in your misbehavior. Well, if you don't want them to invest in you, don't be quite so investable, right? Because I'm telling you, I've lived through decades of litigation reform movements, and this is simply another form of them. And the reason they keep coming up is because they don't work. Money always finds a way, okay? If you are a football team that is constantly losing to your biggest rival, you need to play better. You don't need to lobby to outlaw the other team's owner. 
And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we'll have Will. Hi, everybody. I'm Will Weissman. I'm a director at Parabellum Capital, which is a commercial litigation funder. I'm also a licensed attorney. I was a defense lawyer for many years. Before entering litigation funding, I actually worked in the insurance industry. I was at Liberty in their, in their D&O business. So insurance issues are, are near and dear to me and were a big part of my career professionally. Insurance coverage for funded commercial cases, the type of cases that Parabellum funds, essentially doesn't exist. We don't fund disputes where an insurance company is ultimately going to be responsible for the judgment. We fund business to business disputes for things like breach of contract, patent infringement, IP disputes, and business torts, which are not covered by insurance. Um, the other thing I want to um, mention, just to kind of properly set the table, is how few cases commercial funders actually fund. Unlike consumer funders, which enter into thousands and thousands of transactions per year, commercial funders like Parabellum, we fund relatively few cases per year. And that's true of our competitors as well. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say you could count the number of investments we make per year on, on two hands, but if you said two hands and two feet, you, you might get there. We, we, don't, we don't invest in a lot of transactions, so it's just not a lot of investment activity, right? Now, regulation of commercial litigation funding around the country is very much the exception, not the norm, and that, that's for good reason. Courts have long had the ability to probe funding if, if they want to, and they typically don't do so. And the reason they don't is because, one, it's very well accepted that it's not relevant to the underlying litigation, and two, the funding material, the funding agreement itself, communications with the funder and, and the like, are protected work product. And a number of very serious nonpartisan groups have, have looked into this exact issue and looked into it recently and have concluded that regulation isn't needed here for, for my space, for the commercial space. And I'm talking about the Federal Rules Advisory Committee, which writes the federal rules, the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, which is the a nonpartisan arm of Congress, the Uniform Law Commission, and the New York City Bar, they, they all have reached the same conclusion, that commercial funding is a rare phenomenon, and that the regulation of the type the, the Model Act is proposing is not needed, right? So I think with that in mind, we should talk about what makes the Model Act particularly problematic from, from where I sit. And I think what, you, what everyone needs to appreciate is how prejudicial it is to a funded party to actually be required to turn over the funding agreement. The funding agreement is, tells defense counsel exactly how much money a plaintiff has to spend on their case, right? And it also tells them other critical information that bears directly on litigation strategy, such as exactly how much a plaintiff will, uh, will realize from any settlement. No one in this room, and I've never heard anyone suggest this, would say that a def defend defendants have to turn over their defense budget or that insurers have to turn over information about how much they're reserving for a case or other information that bears directly on defense strategy, and yet that's exactly what the Model Act calls for. The other thing which we will see happen here is if you require turning over the funding agreement, not only are you prejudicing the plaintiff, you're exasperating the problem of, of, of inefficient, wasteful litigation. Defendants don't stop at the funding agreement. They don't say, thank you for telling us, now let's move on to the substance. I was a defense lawyer. We all know the, the name of the game here. It's delay. It's run out the clock, right? So what, what follows from turning over a funding agreement are ancillary discovery fights. People want to see the communications with funders the analysis that went into the underwriting by a funder, and you have to then adjudicate all of these ancillary disputes, which are a sideshow, before you can ever get to the substance, right? I, I don't think that's what's intended here. I think that the, the act is well-intentioned, right? And I think there's a, there's a better way to go about it. And I, I just want to take a final minute here to talk about what that might look like. I think the place to start for sound public policy is protection against the prejudice that I'm so worried about, and I think that everyone in this room should be worried about. 
automatic disclosure of the funding agreement causes substantial harm. The funding agreement itself should be subject to the ordinary rules of discovery. If it's relevant, if it's germane to the dispute, it can be disclosed. If it's not relevant, if it's a sideshow, if it's a defense tactic to, to get at strategic information, it shouldn't be disclosed. The legitimate concerns here are transparency, right? We, people want to know who's funding this case to make sure there's, there's no conflict of interest or nefarious activity going on. Um, Commercial funders don't have a problem with being disclosed. So I think a bill that required a party to disclose funding, that they're a funded party without turning over the funding agreement, I think you'd find wide acceptance in my industry to that. The other, I think, I think a very legitimate concern is passivity. You want to know that a funder's not exercising undue control. And there's ways to get out that information without prejudicing the plaintiff. You can require a statement from the plaintiff that, that the funder is not requiring, is not controlling the litigation. Attorneys who have an ethical duty to not allow that can be required to submit that information to the court. And we've seen other courts deal with these issues that way. That's an effective, sound way to, to, to regulate in this area, which doesn't cause harm to plaintiffs. And, and, uh, and, and slant the playing field in favor of the defense bar, and I think that should be the focus of, of the, the folks in this room. So I, I appreciate the time to comment. I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Up next, Brad Nail. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Brad Nail with Publi uh, Converge Public Strategies, uh, here representing Uber. We thought it would be helpful for the committee to hear the perspective from one of the businesses uh, who was likely to be a defendant in some of the litigation that's backed by the large litigation funding companies. So this is not seen as just another insurer versus trial lawyer uh, issue. We have serious concerns about the impact that heavily funded, securitized litigation is having on our courts. I would ask you to imagine a really bad scenario to explain why both transparency and oversight are needed in this space. Imagine a plaintiff who has accepted financing in the course of conducting its litigation. As is typical today, no one knows the details of that financing uh, or the relationship between the plaintiff and the finance company, not the defendant, not the courts overseeing the litigation. Imagine that the, the plaintiff and the defendant negotiate in good faith and reach a settlement that's agreeable to both sides. Then the litigation finance company steps in to prevent that settlement because they believe the settlement is too low, that it doesn't maximize their potential profit from the lawsuit. Imagine that the finance company actually takes action to prevent the plaintiff from settling the case, even going so far as to try to substitute the finance company as the plaintiff. This is happening today. I would encourage you to read about the antitrust cases involving Cisco Corporation and their litigation funder, Bur funder Burford Capital, and meat producers in Minnesota, where the motion to make the litigation funder the plaintiff was denied, and the similar case in Illinois, where the motion to make the litigation funding company the plaintiff was granted. I would ask you to imagine another bad scenario. In, in any regulated industry, one would suspect that individuals with prior convictions for fraud would be heavily scrutinized, if not prevented from operating the same business for which they were convicted of fraud. But in the case of Tribeca Capital, there have been no such limitations because there is no oversight. The company that is, according to their website, the largest litigation funding company in the US, is run by someone who pled guilty to fraud in conjunction with prior litigation funding activity. Tribeca Capital just last month announced an injection of $50 million into their litigation funding business from a foreign investment group called NERA Capital. Their own press release describes it as a $50 million funding facility for antitrust claims and law firm, firm portfolios. That $50 million is just a drop in the bucket when you look at the scope of litigation funding in the US. Westfleet Advisors, which is a litigation finance advisory firm in March of this year, reported that there was $15.2 billion in combined assets allocated to US commercial litigation investment. That's how they wrote about it in their press release. These are assets 
This is an investment. They are turning our civil justice system into another market for speculative investment activity. So as is nearly always the case for you as legislators, you are called upon to balance competing interests. Access to ju justice is important. We understand that a sizable segment of the industry is dedicated to smaller individual financing arrangements for plaintiffs with meritorious cases and immediate financial needs. But the activity of litigation financers in the aggregate necessitates action. The model before you is good and we will support it. We think it could be made better. We've spoken with Representative Lehman, offered some language to strengthen the transparency and disclosure elements of it even further. I would also direct your attention to the discussion draft of federal legislation released last week by Congressman Issa, which contains disclosure requirements to the court that we think are a good solution. So I'll conclude by emphasizing to you the need for this model, the need for le this legislation, and the need for tr real transparency and oversight of the activity of these investment firms. Thanks. Thank you. Mahima? Thank you so much. My name is Mahima Rago with Zurich North America. I too have practiced as a defense attorney in the past and now work in a uh, social inflation task force within the company. So I'm going to start with some statistics. These statistics are quoted from a Swiss Re report. Uh, they talk about litigation funding com being comprised of personal injury cases, mass tort claims, and commercial litigation. 75% of litigation funding contracts support commercial litigation and mass torts. Two thirds of settlements uh, involve large companies and not small businesses. About 30% of patent infringement cases are believed to have involvement of litigation funding. And as Mr. Neal mentioned, the industry is estimated to be about $15.2 billion. Law firms report that they take litigation funding uh, usually because of lack of funds, and to hedge risk, which uh, sounds awfully like insurance. And lastly, the internal rate of return for some of these uh, litigation funding companies is about 20, 25%. That represents a wealth transfer from the plaintiff back to investors and law firms. So this is an investment, and all investment classes usually have some kind of regulation or some kind of guardrails around them. They usually contain both a consumer angle, something like mortgage lending, where consumers are protected to understand contracts, and a market integrity portion, where we can trust, for example, that the stock market isn't subject to rampant insider trading or manipulation. Similarly, we need these two issues addressed, and the model rule does address both in the form of the disclosure requirement and not just the discovery as uh, representative Layman had indicated. Unfortunately, we're seeing some examples um, that go contrary to some of the research quoted earlier by Professor Klein. I'm going to go through just some of those examples for you. In the Camp Lejeune cases, multiple fraudulent uh, claims were found. Those were filed from lead generators or advertisers looking for plaintiffs to drum up the appearance of more cases. There were uh, various vaginal mesh cases where unnecessary surgeries were performed, again, on the medical funding end. 40,000 fake claims were discovered in the Deepwater Horizon uh, mass litigation. Uh, individuals found uh, claims on, on uh, Craigslist soliciting ADA-type claims um, and a bounty for a hashtag MeToo claim also on Craigslist for $100,000. In New York, there was a slip and fall case which conscripted indigent individuals, many asking for food from their attorneys, to fake accidents, incidents, in order to file insurance claims. There were, of course, funding involved in that as well. And I'll just spend a moment on the Tom Girardi debacle here in California. Mr. Girardi was a prominent attorney. He was subject to the rules of California. Um, both the ethical and legal rules, and he continued for over a decade, almost close to two decades, uh, taking funding, not paying his clients, and practically using his law firm as a Ponzi scheme. 
that entire scheme was supported by multiple lend rounds of lending, um, which nobody knew about, of course, which is why we need the disclosure. If courts had been privy to some of this information, they could have offered some protection to the plaintiffs who later received nothing. As a side note to Real Housewife fans, a lot of that money went to his ex-wife's shoes. The, the other debacle that I'll mention is the McClenley Mosley and Associates where Texas attorneys descended on Louisiana uh, homeowners. They filed fraudulent claims on their behalf and had taken a hefty loan um, collateralized by Zantac litigation. So while it seems like this it could just be a benign help to the consumer, unfortunately just the amount of money involved does lead to law firms uh, getting themselves into bad situations at best and fraudulent activity at worst. I'll also mention that it was mentioned earlier something about insurance and being foreign and whatnot, and it's not lost on me that my company's name is Zurich. However, um, we are heavily regulated in every state, and I would invite the funders to be as heavily regulated if they wish to be in the similar scheme. Thank you. All right, thank you. Up next, Eric Schuler. Thank you, ma'am. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, Eric, you've got three okay. minutes on this. Um, I'm the president for Alliance Responsible Consumer Legal Funding, and we represent companies that offer the consumer legal funding product. So when I clarify, the average funding we give a consumer is about three to $5,000. So we're not giving people tens of thousands of dollars for their cases. We're just making sure that they can pay their mortgage, rent, car payments, keep a roof over their head, and food on the table. One of the thing, couple things that we would just want to clarify is on the changes that were made. We agree with Representative Lehman that it needs to be a, a foundational bill. And so with that, we suggest that taking the, the profit restrictions out of it and let each individual state make the determination. Because we have had states where we have put some stuff in, and we have other states where they haven't had that. We think that should be up to the individual states. As far as the disclosure requirements, we'd like to recommend that we go in our proposal that we've put to the committee before on this is kind of what we did in Indiana. Whereas if requested, there's an acknowledgment of the transaction and then it follows a normal course of discovery, and then finally in the end, it's inadmissible against the consumer. This way does not slant the proceeds, the process rather, one way or the other. By having an automatic disclosure, irregardless of the discovery process, you're basically tilting the case in for the defense. You're giving them a whole lot of information that they may or may not be able to have during a normal course of discovery, and we think that should be that way. We're not opposed to, to regulation. In fact, our organization supports regulation, I think, as, as well as, as Alpha does, too. We just want to make sure that this, pro this product is regulated properly, is available to the consumers, but also does protect the legal system. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Jack? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. I'm Jack Kelly from the uh, American Legal Finance Association. Uh, America's uh, oldest uh, trade association for the leading and prominent members in the American legal finance business. First, I want to reiterate what was stated by my uh, colleague next to me, Mr. Schuler. Our fundings are not in the business of providing funds to prosecute litigation. It's very important to note. You know, earlier we had uh, uh, the, my other gray-haired colleague at the end of the table, uh, the professor, share with us uh, his points. And as we went down the table till we came here, there was an entire discussion about large multi-million dollar funding of litigation. That's funding the litigation. For any of us who practiced, we know what it is to collect fees. But that is knowing that somebody is paying your legal fees. That is giving you money to pay for the prosecution of litigation. That's paying for your witnesses that's paying for your discovery, that's paying for paying for the lawsuit. We do not do that. We have nothing to do with that. We provide a small amount of money to somebody who's already has litigation filed and initiated. 
in a personal injury case. Three, $5,000 to pay for uh, your rent, to get your car fixed, to maybe get school books when you have to get them for your kids. And that money is non-contingent. It's, it's only paid, if, uh, paid back if you, if you prevail in the case. We support this legislation. Representative Lehman and I worked on this 10 years ago. We didn't, we, that day, unfortunately, the bill was not adopted. It was tied. It wasn't defeated. It wasn't passed. It was tied. Representative Lehman went back to Indiana, and uh, he went and passed legislation. A dozen states have done the same thing. And what we, we have here today is a lot of that bill. We have included in here much of the bill that was passed in the New York Senate by Senator Cooney, who a member of this committee is not here today. And it's a good bill. You know, two things that uh, Mr. Lehman and Representative Lehman brought up is, is, can you dictate the case? No. This legislation says you cannot be involved in the decision process. It precludes it. And that's what we need. We need to protect consumers. But there's only one issue that I have concerns with. And I really want to commend the committee and thank you for the, the technical amendments they did. The amendment concerning uh, disclosure of funding, uh, we have concerns with. And our goal is to work together and get this bill done. But our concern is this. You know, I spent a lot of years working in, in the poultry world, and, and, and you're a poultry grower, and you're down in Alabama, and you're out in your F-150, and you have an accident. You got to get that F-150 repaired, and your insurance company, not necessarily in a dispute about how this is going to be paid, but you've got to get down and get feed to be able to get in there and get the chickens fed. And anybody who's ever fed chickens knows if you don't have the, the feed lines filled at night, you don't have the water clean, you're not going to do too well getting those chickens fed, and they're going to die. So you go out and you get $5,000 to help get that truck repaired, and you're back out there. But next door to you down the road is a guy who's a little bit richer than you are, and he's got a brother who's a big, fancy lawyer. And he can go to him and borrow the $5,000. And he just says, his brother says, well, Jim, he says, Jack, you pay that back when you got some money, and we'll, we'll work it out. Now, the guy who had to go get the funding, the way this proposal is written, He's got to tell the other side that he got funding. Just because he doesn't have the financial advantage of being able to go to somebody rich or have somebody who's going to lend him the money. Is that equitable? You know, anybody here who's studied the law or taught the law and, and lived the law knows one word, equity. Equity is what the law is all about. And is that equitable? How do we deal with the equity of letting that funding be disclosed or not disclosed? And I think that's the issue, and I think what, what Mr. Lehman and others have said is that's what we've got to wrestle with. How do we do that? My position is you should only have to disclose funding if the money is used for the prosecution of the litigation. If the money that you get pays for the lawyer, if the money that you get pays for discovery, if the money that you get pays for witnesses, then you should have disclosure. But if the money is used to, to get your truck fixed, is that really fair? With that, I, I, I thank every member of the committee. This committee has done a, a great job in working with this. I want to thank Mr. Lehman, for, Representative Lehman, for the work he's done and, and the fairness you've done. So thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. I appreciate it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you to everyone. Um, I'll now open it up to any legislators. Does anyone have questions? You have one more oh, I'm sorry, John. I skipped right over you. I apologize. I was hiding. Take it away, middle. John. Yes, John Schnauz, National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, who almost got off the hook very easily there. Um, <laughs> we, we are supportive of the model as it stands. Um, I think it's a good baseline starting point for regu regulation for an issue that deserves a lot more scrutiny, and that is, as Representative Lehman said, what are the implications of the fact that litigation is increasingly becoming an investment market? Um, I want to focus specifically on what we like about this. The main thing is what's in the title, and that's disclosure. I also want to be clear, because uh, from some of the earlier speakers, I'm not sure if I'm reading the right model. This 
this bill doesn't ban third-party litigation funding in any way. Um, the provisions it includes are fairly modest, in fact. The most important one, we think, is a disclosure provision. Um, we think the new language is also an improvement in that regard. I do think it needs a little further refinement, and the further refinement is not to apply only in cases where the plaintiff is actually being funded, because that's the way it's structured right now. We think it needs to broadly cover investment in litigation that is contingent on the outcome of the case, because on the commercial side, that is the more common pattern rather than plaintiff funding, we believe. A um, Couple of responses to arguments you've heard. Um, you've heard some contradictory arguments, and you would think sometimes if they're contradictory, maybe one of them is right but I don't think in this case that any of them hold up under very good scrutiny. Uh, first of all, on the litigation budget argument, let's think about this for a minute. What the model actually requires is disclosure of the agreement. What's going to be in the agreement between the funder and the fundee? Well, things that they want to be able to enforce legally against each other. So this idea that that needs to include everything about their litigation strategy, it doesn't. None of that is gonna to need to be in the agreement. There's no reason for it to be in there. Um, we're talking about who the parties are, the funded amount, those sorts of issues, basic information that doesn't go so far as to reveal strategy. I think that's a red herring. Um, second is, I wanna make this clear, the same sort of concern would exist on the insurance disclosure side. Almost every one of you comes from a state, because I think this is true in almost every state, where in litigation, the insurance coverage at issue is disclosed. Not the fact that there is insurance, not the name of the insurer, the actual insurance policy. In some cases that happens, in some states that happens before the litigation is even filed. So I agree insurance and TPLF are not exactly the same thing. Insurance serves a lot of roles in society that don't have anything in particular to do with litigation, fortunately. But in terms of what needs to be disclosed in litigation, we think that analogy is pretty good. Um, again, states are requiring that for insurance. If it's not a concern there, it shouldn't be a concern on the other side as well. Um, finally, we heard an argument that the, originally the argument was that if the funding has to be disclosed, that somehow reveals that the plaintiff is in a bad financial position. That never made much sense because they basically would be saying, I might have been in a bad one, but now I'm not because I got this funding. Earlier we heard the argument of, no, no, it's the opposite. If you don't disclose funding, that proves you're at a disadvantage. That's not a very reasonable inference. You don't know from the fact that someone didn't get funding that they needed it but didn't get it. They may just as well have not needed it. So I don't think that argument holds up very well either, although I do think it makes more sense than the original opposite argument. So um, I'll stop there. There's a lot more we could say, but again, we think the model's a good first step. We think the disclosure provision is the key. We think it needs to stay strong and be about disclosure of the actual agreement. And I will stop there. All right, thank you. Now we're gonna open it up to the legislators that have any questions or comments. And up first, we have Rep. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I, I think, you know, I've heard, I've heard this for several meetings now, and I, I, I tend to side with, with Jack on a lot of this. If it's covering the litigation costs. First of all, I, I don't necessarily agree with disclosure at all, but to the extent that we will do it, that if it's funding those costs, then that's fine, but if it's funding ne you know, necessary expenses for the plaintiff, then maybe that does not need to be disclosed. However, my question is more about the model itself, and maybe I missed it. In section seven, I think it's saying that the duty is on the plaintiff or his attorney to disclose. And, and so I'm not sure if we're not overstepping our, our bounds a little bit, and, and at least in Louisiana that we might be legislating something that might be better left to the Supreme Court who legislates attorneys and attorney behavior. Um, but more so in section eight for the violations, the violation is on the litigation finance company. So, the way it reads right now, me as an attorney, if I decide that I'm not going to do that, then there's no violation at all. There's nothing that you can do to enforce it against me. I guess the punishment is against the company. And I'm, I'm not sure, maybe I missed it, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see if somebody can reconcile that for me. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, 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 I'll say this. I think when you, and, and again, I'm going to say this goes back to, you made the comment, Representative Jordan, about Louisiana this. I think this goes back to what you do in your state. Because there are states that, that will say, this is, this, is the, this is where we're going to put the, the rules and the violations and things like that. It might be different in Indiana than it is in, in Louisiana. So I, I think, again, I think there has to be some reference in the model to there is a, there is a if then, but that then I think needs to be limited to what you do on the, on the state level. I know that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but I'm not about to trade barbs with a very talented lawyer. All right. No, I, I'm just looking at it, and, and as we go forward, uh, maybe we need to, to figure out if we can reconcile those Section 7 and Section 8 to make it more compatible. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Up next, Representative Meredith. If I could have two brief questions. Uh, Professor Klein, you know, I'm not an insurance agent. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm a small-town country banker. Uh, and when you mentioned the fact that you didn't see a need for anything with regard to uh, caps on these fees or interest in these situations because they're represented by a lawyer, I find that a very curious proposal because, you know, I I've kind of feel like I represent clients that have 20 and 30 year relationships with me and I have to disclose all those fees. We have caps on all our fees. And many times if they can get a better deal through Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or somebody else, I'm gonna send them there because it's a long-term relationship. When in reality, even though you might be represented by an attorney, that attorney's going to be paid based on a contingency of what your case is worth and what they can squeeze out of that case. And so they have a modicum of, of future um, ability for their own gain as well, just like we would, but we're still enforced by the same level uh, of caps on fees and interest, and so I don't think that argument holds up. I'd like you to, to respond to that. Sure, and, and let me tell you, uh, first of all, there was nothing that scared me more in a case than when my opponent said they were just a small country lawyer, because <laughs> that meant I was about to get my butt kicked. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, what I'm saying is this. The reason we put, no one's a big fan of regulation. Regulation just puts an inefficiency on everything. The reason we have consumer protection regulation is because we view consumers to be in a disadvantageous position, right? They, 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 they need the money, so they go for a payday lender. They don't have anybody telling them that's a bad deal, okay? They, they get these flashy credit card companies coming in and saying, you know, basically free money. They don't have anybody telling them it's a bad deal. That's not a plaintiff who's a consumer. A plaintiff who's a consumer and has filed a lawsuit has an attorney. They are the plaintiff's attorney. If they do their job ethically, some of them don't. Some insurers don't do their job ethically. Some legislators don't do their job ethically. But most people do, okay? If they do their job ethically, they are telling their client here are the pros and cons of this deal. We're giving you the information. You're an adult. Does this deal make sense to you? And so there is no reason in that setting, recognizing that some people get hoodwinked, most won't, to have a layer of regulation that says a well-informed consumer, well-counseled, who needs the money and the deal makes sense to them, can't take it because we're going to cap what the deal can be. I would just say, I think in a highly regulated industry like any kind of financial services that has disclosure requirements already, you are providing those same levels of pros and cons that an attorney would provide. And again, in that situation, the attorney's contingencies are still going to figure into that discussion if they have any ethical lapse whatsoever. And so I think that is not something that necessarily holds water, just my personal opinion. Yeah, and I don't know that you and I greatly disagree, frankly. Uh, second question, very quickly. Uh, just, I think we've heard in a couple of different conversations, Mr. Weisman, you have referred to your, um, your work previously with Liberty Mutual and, and you talked about strategy and certain, some of those kinds of things in that process. I just want to be clear that that does not represent anything that Liberty Mutual uh, in the, the views that you have expressed here today. I, I'm not here on behalf of Liberty Mutual. I'm with Parabellum Capital. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? 
Okay, with that, for closing remarks, Madam, we're going to go. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? I, I asked leave to be able to submit a uh, statement for the record. Pardon? I asked yeah. leave to be able to submit a statement for the record. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, now we're going to go back to Representative Lehman for some closing remarks on this model. All right. Thank you, everybody. I, I think we had a good, robust discussion today. Um, I think some very valid points were brought up on, on both sides of this. Um, I guess what I would ask in closing is this, and that is one thing I want to go back to when I first began. I, I know I've had several people reach out about splitting this into two, the, the commercial versus the consumer. I think it needs to leave NCOIL as one. What you do back at your state, to, can, you can split these apart, but I don't want to run two different models through NCOIL when they're very similar. So we will keep this as one model. Um, second is, Representative Jordan may bring up some issues on some violations, which actually takes us down the path of other, other I'll call it a small tweak, but other small tweaks uh, we need to address, let us know. But obviously this is gonna hinge at the end on disclosure. Um, and I think we really gotta work on that piece. And, and so I guess I would say this, as we, as we get into the interim call, probably, I don't know when that'll be, sometime between now and November, um, is to uh, let myself or let Will uh, uh, know uh, where, where you're at and where you wanna see some changes because we do need input from this committee. <clears throat> I think, uh, I mean, I'll agree, I think Jack makes a valid point on, you know, do we talk about disclosure if it's being used to fix my truck versus being used to pay my lawyer? There's some merit in that. Um, I think there's merit in the fact of, of, of you know, I, I think uh, a representative pointed out that there's, you know, we, banking and insurance is the same thing. So heavily regulated, uh, our products are regulated. I think one comment was made about, um, you know, that they don't have to disclose, the, the insurance companies don't have to disclose their money, but they're a second party to these claims, not a third party. So uh, there's a difference there. They're, they're heavily, heavily regulated in those states. I think that's what brought our attention to some of this is I think a lot of stuff going on, you heard some nefarious stuff, is because of the less lack of regulation. Um, so I think we need to stay focused on that. Um, so with that, I, I would say, Madam Chair, thank you for the discussion. Uh, please reach out and reach out to NCOIL. I would like to get a, a nice, uh, uh, some amendments put together uh, for our interim call so we can pass this out in San Antonio in November. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Lehman. And again, just to um, follow up, if anyone has questions or comments on the model, please reach out to Representative Lehman. Uh, myself or Will, because again, we will probably be having an interim call this fall prior to uh, November's next meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next on our agenda is a presentation on the regulation of bail bonds industry. With us here today, we will have Jeff Clayton as the American Bail Coalition and John Looney of the National Association of Bail Agents. So I'm going to say thank you both for being here, and then please go ahead. We'll start out with Jeff, and then uh, we'll hold questions until both are finished. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is John Looney. I know you said you were going to start with Jeff, but the way we got it, we'll go on. Um, I am the executive vice president of the National Association of Bail Agents, president of the Montana Bail Agents Association, and I'm a bondsman. Um, so why am I sitting in front of the, the N coil? Well, it's because I'm an appearance surety bond producer. I write insurance. Um, I don't have my leathers on and my ponytail, but that's what I do is, is bail bonds. Um, it, bail is an insurance product. It involves, with, it involves risk assessment, premiums. Um, at the core of it, it's a surety bond. A bail, uh, it's a contractual agreement between the courts, a defendant, and the surety producer that the defendant or offender is going to appear for court. Uh, it's a financial agreement. If uh, I write a surety bond, the defendant fails to appear, I have to pay the court. 
Uh, with that comes a lot of responsibility um, and accountability, which means um, I get to define the terms of my surety bail agreement and my contact, contact, contractual agreement with my defendant. Um, if he fails to appear, I can go arrest him and return custody of him back to the court. Um, I think it's important that regulators understand the, the use of the correct termino or terminology in the insurance surety bail system. Um, there's a significant difference between secured bail and cash bail. Uh, we get a lot of questions uh, and it's in the news all the time. You hear about the changes in cash bail and we need to do bail reform. Cash bail is a judge setting a cash requirement of whatever amount for a defendant to get out of jail in order to move through their court and get their uh, problems taken care of. Where a surety bail or a secured bail is a surety writing a insurance product that says we're gonna accept the liability. The court then transfers custody of that defendant to the bail bondsman and the bail bondsman promises that that defendant's going to appear for court. Uh, the role of the surety bondsman is to ensure court appearance. That's, that's it. Uh, my insurance that I write says, I promise this guy's going to show up for court. Um, I protect public safety because I put a lot of uh, stringent requirements on my defendants when I remove them from the custody of the jail. They're required to check in with me weekly. They're required to tell me where they're at. They're not allowed to leave the state. They have to have family with them. They have to tell me where they live. Public safety is paramount when a surety bondsman is involved. Um, we advocate for victims. We make sure that our, our defendants aren't going where they're not supposed to be going. They follow the rules that the court set for them before they were released from court or from, released from jail. Uh, we alleviate, or alleviate jail overcrowding. Um, the pretrial services or um, anything other than a bondsman don't work 24-7, 365. A bondsman works 24 hours, 365 days a week. You get arrested on a Friday night at 5.30, you don't get to see a judge until Monday at nine o'clock. A bondsman can come in and get you out and start the process anytime. Um, and that brings me to the next, my next thing is the difference between secured bail and pretrial services. Secured bail operates at zero cost to the taxpayer, unlike your state run pretrial services which require significant public funding. The key differences, the 24 seven, 365 day a year availability, our doors don't close. Surety bailmen or surety uh, producers are available 24 seven. Uh, accountability, bail agents are accountable financially and contractually with the court that says, I took custody of the defendant, I'm going to make sure that he does what you say judge and I'll make sure he comes back and appears before the court. Um, and efficiency, I, I don't know that it needs to be said, but I don't know of uh, another government program that runs more efficient than the, the bail industry. Um, we have the latest technology, we have the training, we have um, all the things in place that uh, we put there to secure our financial obligations. Um, the importance of the of leg legislative regulation is number one, consumer protection. Uh, regulations prevent the exploitation of defendants, individuals, and families during the, one of the most vulnerable times of their lives. Um, market stability, standardizing rates of uh, premium bail, promotes healthy competition among bail bond businesses, and prevents any single company or entity from dominating the market and accountability and transparency. Regulatory frameworks require bail bond companies to adhere to guidelines, maintain ethical standards, and preventing fraudulent practices. One of the big issues with regulatory frameworks are the clarity and interpretation of laws. 
in my home state of Montana, there's 207 courts. And of those 207 courts, not a single one of them processes a bail bond the same way because there's no regulatory framework in place that says this is how a bail bond works. Um, it's kind of like the Wild West. And yes, I'm from Montana, so that makes sense. But um, good laws or good regulatory frameworks create consistency in application. So there isn't a question if I write a bond on one side of the state versus another side of the state. Uh, it increases judicial efficiency. Um, in other words, we don't have judges or um, jurisdictions creating their own version of how a bail bond works. Um, and good laws will maintain legislative intent. So in plain English, we write a law or the legislation passes a law, it should not be able to be interpreted any other way than what it was intended to be interpreted as. Um, in conclusion, the secured bail is a vital component of our criminal justice system. It bridges the gap between public safety, judicial efficiency, and the rights of defendants. Effective regulation and clearly defined legislative language are crucial to maintaining the integrity of that system. By fostering a fair and transparent bail bond industry, you can ensure that justice is served while protecting the interests of all stakeholders involved. I thank you for your time, and I'm available for any questions. Jeff? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Uh, my name is Jeff Clayton. I'm the Executive Director of the American Bail Coalition, which is a trade association of insurance companies who underwrite the liability written by our friends, uh, the bail bondsmen throughout uh, the United States. Uh, since the conquest, simple words, all prisoners shall be bailable by sufficient sureties has sort of been the fight over bail. And for those of you who don't remember when the conquest was, it was 10, uh, the year 1066. So for guys working in bail, uh, like me, uh, uh, bail uh, legislation, that means a lot of job security. Um, but what it does mean in the modern era is that you have three branches of government regulating our industry. You have the judicial branch regulating it at an administrative level, who can write bonds in that particular court, and on a case-by-case -case level, whether we can accept this bond, whether you use criminal proceeds to post that bond. And then we have departments of insurance issuing licenses to bail bondsmen, regulating surety corporations, and then we have regulations of when people don't pay and we shut them off from continuing to write bonds, and that is handled. And so when you look at all the jurisdictional lines as we put in the materials to try to decide where this jurisdictional line is, we use a legal term of art to, dis to define that, which is quite fuzzy. And every state does it differently, uh, and we are here uh, to help you do that. Why are we here? We're here to tell you it's a critical thing to regulate. Why? Because sus or the accused's access to bail depends on it. Integrity of the system, answering for the charges, depends on it. Criminal deterrence uh, depends on it. And so it is a very, uh, a very important concept. You know, when I transitioned from law practice to uh, government relations, I was running a bill for Governor, then Governor Ritter. And I sat down at a table with my dad and his uh, partner who were old time uh, cops, retired cops and lobbyists. And they said, hey, Jeff, how's your first week going? And I said, I gotta be honest with you. Uh, my, I, I don't think I'm gonna be able to get this bill out. And they said, well, why not? And I said, you know, my sponsor just doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, my dad's partner, Tony, looked at me and he said, Jeff, I'm gonna give you a little advice down this Capitol. If you wanna pass a bill, you need a sponsor that knows how to run a two car funeral. And your guy, he didn't know how to run a two-car funeral. This is a personality business. This is a business of knowing what you're talking about. And I like to think that we know what we're talking about when it comes to the regulation of bail. So if you need to know what you're talking about and you need to run uh, that two-car funeral and you feel like you can't run it, uh, definitely give us a call. We're here to help and explain the framework of how all this happens uh, in each of your states and help you make the best public policy you can. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um I'll open this up now to any legislator questions or comments. No, seeing none, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is a continued discussion on the NCOIL Earned Wage Access Model. You can view the model in your binders on page 134 and on the website and app. Also before you and the website app, as well as are some responses to some questions that were distributed before the conference in an effort to try and get some clarification on some issues related to the model. 
Before we go any further, I'll turn things over to the sponsor of the model, New York Assemblywoman and NCOIL Vice President, Pam Hunter. Uh, Assemblywoman Hunter stepped out for a minute. We're going to see if she's available here. Otherwise, we'll just keep going. Just go. You know what, Ben? Um, I think what we're going to do is we. Oh, here comes Assemblywoman Hunter. Thank you. Um, so. We have been speaking about this model for quite some time. We did have a interim meeting in July and there were some questions that came out of that meeting. And um, my colleagues have some of those uh, questions that were passed around. And so what I would like, we have a couple folks here today uh, to talk about this bill and we're not gonna be voting on it today, um, but really just trying to get to there's been differing opinions and statements relative to earn wage access. And so we would like some clarifying. So if each of you who are here today could provide some feedback, um, especially in the form of the proposed amendments to the model, uh, I think that we're supposed to see a video. I think, is there some video? Um, if you could touch briefly on the amendments and I just, I think we all need a better understanding. Do people have to pay? Is it not alone? Um, so if you could walk through some of that for us, please. We'll watch the video. Um, everyone knows if you have any amendments, you can send them to me, my staff. Also, Will, uh, the chair here as well, that we could work through to try to get to some conclusion uh, for this model in November. Thank you, Assemblywoman Hunter. With us here today are Ben LaRocco of Earn In and Andrew Kushner of the Center for Responsible Lending. And then we'll hold all of our questions until both are finished. Gentlemen, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, Will, are we going to do the video? OK. Great. So um, we, uh, we did a video of what the actual customer experience is for Earn In users. So um, you'll be able to see sort of what it's like from the time you um, download and have your account until you actually use the product and what that looks like. So that's uh, what's going on here. So go ahead and hit play and I will narrate as we um, sort of uh, go through because there's no sound. Um, so, you, so anybody can download um, the app in the App Store. This is, this is what'll, what, what it will look like when you do. So. Um, you first, you start, you connect your bank account. We use a third-party service called Plaid. Um, that's uh, many financial services companies use that. It allows us to uh, have read-only access into the user's bank account. Uh, that's how we verify their, um, their employment, and um, we do some uh, risk modeling uh, uh, based on that as well. Um, so this first platypus, first platypus bank is a, you know, not a real bank, but just shows you, um, uh, gives you a representative of what it might look like. Um, this will, this also, uh, you choose where your money goes into when you access your funds. Um, so that's the other reason that you connect your bank. Mm -hmm. Happy to answer questions on this process, even though uh, we said we we're going to hold them to the end as we're going through if anybody has them. Uh, maybe policy questions at the end. Um, you are able to add a debit card if you would like. Uh, if you add the debit card, you're able to get your earnings in seconds uh, for a fee, which you'll see the option of how that presents itself in just a minute. Uh, you don't have to have a debit card in order to do that. Um, there's your various terms and conditions. Um, further verifying your employer. Uh, again, we work direct to consumer, so um, virtually anybody that has a regular paycheck uh, and a direct deposit employer can use Earnin. 
Uh, there's two uh, main ways right now we verify um, uh, verify our uh, verify earnings. One, we use your work email to verify your employment, and two, we um, track the amount of time that you're uh, at, at work. And you choose which one uh, to use. Um, so this is what the user experience will look like once you've um, gone through the setup and the um, accepting of the terms and conditions. That $100 is the amount of earnings that you have, you've earned it. This is you choosing how much of that $100 available you wanna use. So again, you can either, the standard version is free, that's ACH, that's usually next business day but could be up to three days. Um, or debit, and there are fees for the debit, which is immediate, and those are disclosed there in the process. So you choose which one you want. Um, the other way we make money is we ask people for a voluntary tip. We've talked about this before. This is the, um, the user experience for that. Um, you'll see that we do suggest a tip, uh, but it's very easy to uh, change that and make it anything you want, including zero. So here we go, this person um, just chose to tip zero. Um, here is uh, the amount they're accessing, the total amount they're paying, and the amount, uh, the day of their pay date, so that uh, that way they'll know when they get paid back. Or when we get paid back, excuse me. All right, that's it. That's the, that's, uh, that's the transaction, so um, thanks for bearing with me on that. Um, I don't have any other further prepared remarks. Uh, I did submit answers to the questions. We submitted uh, some amendments with uh, the reasoning for those amendments, and then we submitted some amendment, uh, excuse me, some comments on uh, the uh, amendments that Andrew submitted. So uh, I'll pause there. Happy to take questions um, when we get to that position. Andrew, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to members of the committee for having me. Uh, Andrew Kushner, Senior Policy Counsel at the Center for Responsible Lending. Um, and, and yeah, I, I don't have a ton of prepared remarks today. I really appreciate this continued conversation. I have, uh, I, I think, printed out copies of our responses to the committee's questions are before all of you. I think the one thing that I do want to mention actually is some late breaking news in the EWA space actually just today the CFPB issued a notice of a proposed interpretive rule under the Truth in Lending Act. Um, and there are three key aspects to that rule that are like very relevant to this committee's work and in particular to some of the questions that Assembly Member Hunter was talking about. You know, are these products loans? What constitutes a finance charge? So the, so the CFPB is the nation's uh, federal financial regulator, um, expert in interpreting and applying the Truth in Lending Act, is proposing a rule that would say that uh, earned wage advanced products, the ones like earn in or that we're talking about in the context of this model legislation, are credit products under the Truth in Lending Act. That's a straightforward conclusion that we think is correct by applying the language of the statute, uh, you know, prior judicial decisions and, uh, and prior guidance from the CFPB and other federal agencies. And in the rulemaking also says that, uh, that those expedite fees that you saw an example of, as well as most tips, um, are finance charges subject to TILA. So, you know, in our country, we have essentially a dual system of credit regulation at the state level, uh, you know, interest rate caps and some of the more substantive terms of credit transactions are set. The federal level, there's the sort of, there's the umbrella truth and lending act that governs disclosure obligations uh, you know, for all different types of credit products, you know, whatever their terms and conditions. And what the CFPB has said in really a, that the baseline definition of a credit product, EWA fits within that. Uh, and we think that's the right result and we think that it should inform this, uh, this committee's work. So um, you know, we submitted amendments uh, to the proposed bill. I think the, the key aspects of our amendments are uh, you know, there needs to, these, these products should be regulated as credit. Uh, there should be a cost cap because these products, like other credit products, you know, can effectively create their own demand 
uh, when folks are paying for them, uh, paying high rates for them, and getting uh, caught in a cycle of reborrowing. Um, and the CFPB's uh, work uh, uh, really um, backs that up. So I'll, I'll stop there. Also happy to take any questions on, uh, on any of the submissions that I've, I've made for the committee. Thank you, gentlemen. I'll now open it up to legislators. Are there any questions or comments from our legislators? Representative Lehman. Thank you. Um, I, I, sorry, I apologize. I came in after you'd already started your presentation. But is my understanding your only fee you charge is the service fee if they choose something other than the, you know, ACH? Yeah. And, and then a tip? Correct. Yeah. There's no. There's no late fees. There's no interest. There's no uh, mandatory fees of any sort. And there's no fee to sign up for the program. Correct. All right. Thank you. Sure. I have a quick question for you. What What is the role of the employer here then? I mean, at some point, somebody's paying this back. How, can you sure. walk yeah. us through the mechanics? Yeah. Great question. Um, and that it's actually this is one of sort of the differences that we have in our amendments um, is sort of the the terms of how you get paid back. And there's um, three main ways that um, companies partner with employers. Um, one is they don't partner at all. So we have two million customers. Um, the vast majority of those customers, we don't have a relationship with their em employees, uh, with their employers, excuse me. So, um, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have 100 congressional staffers that use our product, but we don't have any relationship with the U.S. Congress. Um, but we do have relationships with some employers, uh, and there's two ways that companies have relationships with employers. One is sort of like a co-marketing agreement where um, there's not actually a, um, a, a business relationship. It's more of like a referral. Um, we have relationships like that with large employers like Home Depot and Walgreens where they basically say download the, uh, the Earn an app and you get a discount on that fee. So it's less than the $3.99 for, for other people. Um, the other way is that um, you are integrated in the employer's payroll system and, uh, and then you get paid back basically from the employer rather than through the employee's bank account. Thank you. Does that spark any questions? Seth so Hackett, please go ahead. I have a question, uh, and, and I understand that the, the fee comes, uh, and, and whether it's loan or interest, we understand. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, so when you do that, so the fee comes from, from the tip. I mean, that's basically where the tip, and when you multiply it, annually for the year, for the short period of time, it can really increase the APR, you know, especially when there's not a lot of money in the, the tip. And use an example of $11 on 100. You know, that could be, you multiply that for the whole year. That's, uh, that's a lot. The other two things you mentioned were the debit card and another fee. Do you make any money off of the debit card? So, make... so if, you get, um, if you get your wages on a debit card, um, then the... Uh, the issuing company, and that, that's usually going to be the earned wage access company, does get the interchange fee on that. And that would be the same interchange fee that anybody else would get. Um, and there, there's no fee to the, um, to the user for that. It, it comes from the, uh, you know, the normal interchange system. So my, so my question then is, earn in because you'll bring in a lot more debit cards than potentially. Can you negotiate directly with the, that third-party company that's saying, hey, look, you, know, you, you normally charge this. We want a little part of that. Yeah, I think, I mean, um, not for the interchange. The interchange fees are, like, set by Visa. Um, so, you know, even with a big number for us, that's yeah. still a small number to Visa. So we don't okay. really have that um, sort of market power, unfortunately. Okay. That, that was my only question. Yeah, and I know you made money. Yeah. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just... As I'm listening to this one, I just dig down a little bit further, and that is it looks like all of the ways that you could make money off of this are voluntary. Um, they can pay fees. They can pay, make tips. They can do all these things. How do you stay in business? Um, are they just that generous? Or, you know, <laughs> what pays the bills? And then the other thing is if the paycheck can still go to the individual and rely on them to give you payment back. Uh, what kind of bad debts do you encounter? Yeah, th those are great questions and very common questions that we get. So, yeah, so all, all of the fees are, are 
um, are voluntary. Um, I like to describe it as a lot of financial services, especially that serve um, you know, the working class, uh, monetized by punishment, you know, overdrafts, late fees, high interest rates that change. Um, we only monetize if um, we have a system or a, a product that the consumers want to opt into. Um, I think, uh, to, but to your, to your point, like, we don't necessarily know every transaction that a certain person is going to choose the fee or a certain person is going to pay a tip or not a tip. Most people don't tip. Most transactions don't have a tip. Some do. Um, about two-thirds of the transactions uh, opt into the expedited fee. Um, and so when you're doing hundreds of millions of transactions, which is how many you know, transactions we've done over the course of our business, you know, you know on average how many people are, are going to choose the fee, you know, on average how many tips they're going to make. And so that, that gets built into the business model. Um, uh, as far as like not paying us back, um, every company is a little bit different and it fluctuates throughout the year. Um, a published number is about 3% of transactions don't get paid back. Um, so just putting that into perspective and talking about what Senator Hackett said earlier. So you take 3%, the average transaction's nine days long. So just the non-payment rate, 3% over nine days, um, if you were to annualize that, that's 128% APR. Um, so 3% doesn't sound like that, oh you, oh, you get paid back 97% of the time. But when you analyze that, it's 128%. And so um, the, the APR, um, disclosure in that instance when you're dealing with such a short amount of time I think becomes a lot less salient and, and not actually applicable to the true costs that the, um, that the user might be paying, which is why we've suggested other disclosures which we feel would be more salient to the customer. Follow up. Oh, thank you. I just, uh, just a, a quick question. Do you have any data that would suggest, um, like you, you have repeat customers? In other words, somebody gets in a cycle of having to get a loan one week and oh, the next week the same thing. What kind of data do you have that would show that? Yeah, I'll answer, and I'm sure Andrew, I'll, I'll CRL has done a lot of work on this too that we don't necessarily agree with, but um, yeah, I, I think we see a couple use cases, um, and actually, so. The CFPB put information out today. Um, I agree with everything Andrew said about that. Um, we disagree vehemently with what the CFPB said today. It's almost certainly gonna be decided in the courts. And that's why I think you guys actually do have a big opportunity here. There's an existing rule. It's not a good fit for this product. It needs some clarity. Um, on the federal level, it seems like the courts are probably gonna provide that unless Congress steps in. But I think on the state level, you guys can do that. Uh, the CFPB today showed like a, a U-shaped curve so um, there's a lot of people that use it just two or three times and then never use it again. Um, there's a lot of people that use it a couple times and then don't use it again. Um, uh, or, you know, they use it and then they don't use it for three months and then they come back and they use it for a couple months and then, or, you know, for a little while and then they don't use it again for a couple months and they come back. And then there's some people, I, I think a lot of us know these people, that they just aren't great managing their money and they do use it a lot. Um, and my, my, generally when I get asked questions to lawmakers like you is, if, People are going to use, some people are going to use our product a lot. But if you take away our product, they're going to be using some other product a lot too. They're going to be using a credit card. They're going to be using loans. They're going to be using something else. And the downside risks to the customers, like those customers that really just are not great at managing their money, are going to be higher in most of those other products than the downside risks of our product. And if I could just jump in quickly on that on that question, there are a couple of, um, of figures that put out by government regulators. The California DFPI said on average, so the California State Financial Regulator has a data set of EWA transactions provided by companies, and you know, and you know they found on average users took out 36 transactions a year. The CFPB today said in their data set the average was was 27. And what's interesting about what the C CFPB said is. They, roughly, ha roughly half of those users took out more than one a month, but the average was still 27 a year, which means you have a, a small number of really high users, people who use it all the time. And it actually, in fact, that's a distribution you see with payday loans as well, like 70% of payday loan originations go to users who take out 10 or more of them per year. And there's a, small, and there's a relatively small number of users actually 
who fit that bill. But, but that for us is very concerning because it shows that there are, there are um, a, a small number of people who are the source of a lot of the origination in this market. I mean, similar statistics you see, for instance, in like sports gambling apps on your phone, right? There's a small group of users who use the apps all the time. And that for us is the reason why cost caps and other protections are necessary to protect you know, folks who really are financially vulnerable. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, with that, where? Oh, please go ahead. How about now? There we go. Uh, Assemblymember Alex Bors from New York. Um, you mentioned that uh, I think about you said two thirds do, of users roughly do the expedited option, and the majority don't leave tips. Is there any more precision about how many people leave tips, or sort of how that revenue compares to the the short term? The yeah, expedited? I mean, it, it so it changes, right? Two million customers, um, uh, like forty five percent of people leave a tip, um, you know, about 20% never tip ever, um, like 10% tip every time, and most people tip sometimes and not other times. Um, our median tip is zero, our average tip is $1.25. Um, so that's, that's sort of the order of magnitude of what you, of what you see. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Okay, with that, we're gonna go back to Assemblywoman Hunter uh, for some closing remarks. Thank you. Um, I just mentioned to my colleague, it didn't escape me that it's uh, ironic that the, the conversation we just had before this relative to litigation funding was, I don't have money, I need to be fronted money, that I may have to pay a little bit of money in order to get money. And this is in some ways a similar situation. I worked, I need money, I'm getting money from someone to to maybe pay a little bit of money. Um, there's the overall problem, obviously, in this country that dictates we need these kinds of products, and that's not what we're here to, to solve today. Um, it's uh, interesting what that new um, information today that was released, um, is it alone, is it not alone? Um, I think when we first started this conversation several months ago, and I started the conversation with I worked it, why can't I get paid today? And that started this whole kind of conversation um, relative to why am I having to pay a fee for getting my money today? Employers could essentially pay their employees every single day. They don't or can't for a variety of reasons. So we're presented with this model um, that I, I hope with amendments and based on all of your considerations that we can present a foundation that you bring back to your state, but this is not going away. This issue is not going to stop just because we don't do something about this, and each state obviously is going to be presented with this issue that they're going to have to address, and addressing the underlying problem obviously is probably a greater issue than trying to you know, fix this, but I do appreciate um, the repeated conversations that we're having relative to this, obviously, with Ernan, you're fitting a need, you know, for consumers who obviously have, for whatever reason, a myriad of issues that they need money and they need it today. Um, it, we would be uh, derelict if we didn't, you know, take into con consideration, obviously, consumer protections because we want to make sure, you know, people are are protected when they have these products. So we're going to have to go back um, again if you have any conversation, any questions, any um, more thoughts about amendments, we'd like to come up with some kind of solid foundation for you all to consider. Um, we'll probably have an interim meeting uh, before our November meeting to, to take back, but I would suggest strongly in the states that you represent, you're having conversations, you know, you need to bring it back to your legislatures and, you know, really kind of dig down because uh, if we don't do something the, the, the companies are going to be out there cont continue to do what they're doing and consumers may in some cases, I'm not saying here, but some cases be being charged money and this is not a, they worked it. We're talking about actual pay for people working at their job. So we're having conversations about getting a 
alone or not alone, in advance or whatever the word is that we want to call it, based on actually working. So I appreciate um, the time, uh, Madam Chair. Well, thank you, Assemblywoman Hunter. And again, if anyone has questions, comments, or on the model, please out, reach out to myself, Assemblywoman Hunter, or the MCOIL staff. And I want to thank everybody. So with that, um, I have one more piece of business. which is really a reminder that our Workers' Compensation Insurance Committee has jurisdiction over a model law dealing with structured settlements. That model crosses different lines of insurance, so we've begun providing notice to everyone when the model is being discussed by the Work Comp Committee. It's likely that the Work Comp Committee will have another presentation on structured settlements during its November meeting, so if you have any questions or comments, please reach out to the Chair, Michigan Senator Lanathies, or the NCOIL staff. Business I do, Madam Chair, if I could. Please. Uh, I have a question for uh, Assemblywoman Hunter, but also for the other members of the delegation from New York. You know, it's really important that the legislators who are seated up at this table are, in fact, legislators. And I was just wondering, do you, do you know if Assemblyman uh, Gandolfo has a twin brother? Because yesterday there was an Assemblyman Gandolfo here who, who looked like a much older fella, and now we have this young kid over here, and I don't know, is it? That's, 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 it is an imposter. Can we do some DNA testing on that? Back to you, Matt. All righty, okay. So we are going to adjourn with that, but I just want to do a little follow-up. Up next at 6 o'clock, I want to remind everybody that our CIP member and sponsor reception, as a reminder, that is open to public policymakers, staff, CIP members, and summer meeting sponsors. The reception is on the rooftop terrace on the second floor. And hearing no further business, I ask for a motion to adjourn. And then a second? Second. All righty. Thank you, everyone.